I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Sean Butcher and I'm on the board of directors of Heritage Frederick and I chair the organization's collections committee. Heritage Frederick is a nonprofit organization that researches and shares the significant historical impact of Frederick County, Maryland on our state, nation, and world. You can learn more about our work at frederichistory.org. We are bringing a number of virtual programs to you called Heritage Frederick at Home, which focuses on bridging the past to the future. Our guest today is Paul Dixon. Paul and I actually have gone back a number of years. I first hosted a, a book talk by Paul from when he wrote and put out a book called Words from the White House, which is a collection of terms or phrases that was coined by presidents or White House staffers. I followed that up with a, a, quite a hefty book when Paul put out the Dixon Baseball Dictionary, which is a huge volume of, of baseball phrases and terminology. But today, we're actually gonna be talking about Paul's recent book, which was published in early July, called The Rise of the GI Army. So before we talk about that book, I wanna introduce Paul a little bit further. Paul Dixon is the author of more than 60 nonfiction books, focusing on everything from electronic warfare and baseball to the 20th century history in the American language. He served as a line officer in the US Navy with a specialty in cryptology, cryptology, excuse me. He worked for Electronics Magazine, where he focused on covering NASA during the Apollo period. But since 1968, he has been a full-time freelance writer and has contributed to publications like the Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, Esquire, and others. He's a founding member and past president of the Washington Independent Writers. So Paul, I'm gonna bring you in here and, and I wanna just start off by asking you, why did you write this book? That had never been really told before um, between the covers of a book. I mean, it had been told uh, you know, orally in, in the conversations, but um, so in, in 2005, I went to the, the two places. I went to the Eisenhower Library, did a lot of research there in Abilene, Kansas, and the I went to the Pritzker Military Library in Chicago, which is probably the best military library in the country. Um, there may be one better, but it's extraordinary. And I started working on this book. I started developing it, and and it, and it. Uh, I wrote four other books in between, including um, the 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 words from the White House. Those are sort of keep to keep bread on the table, so to speak. Uh, and I just became haunted by this story and, and, and trying to get deeper and deeper into it and, and discover who the people were who, who really saved the country. And so, um, and for me, it was a revelatory moment because I, I began to, I began to go to, I'd go to libraries and places and book sales and try to look up some of the things I write about in this book, like the Louisiana maneuvers, for example and found almost nothing. And so I had to really dig. I had to really go through a lot of archives and primary source materials, uh, newspapers, daily newspapers from obscure places like you know small towns in Louisiana and so, such. And um, that's how I put it together. And I came up with, it, it's been a while to sort of get it right. I mean, we, I did a couple of, people don't want to, this is like telling them how sausages are made, but I, but I, but I, you know, I had two pretty full rewrites. I had two line edits. I had two copy edits. Um, I had a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some key people, the Brigadier General in the Air Force who taught history at the Air Force Academy, a man um, I knew that had been in World War II uh, in, the, in the Armored Division, uh, who's now 91, um, and probably knows more about World War II tanks than anybody at West Point. But I had these people go through it for accuracy. Um, and this was, and this wasn't just little, you know, this was really, what do you really call this particular division? So, so, mm -hmm. so the process was pretty elaborate. Um, and, it, and it took, you know, we, it took a while. So I, 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 I'm really very happy with it and very proud that I, that I got it out and it's done. <laughs> and you cover a number of topics, which I really hope that we can dive into. Um, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, the U.S. Army numbered fewer than 200,000. Can you set the stage for what was going on in this country in terms of uh, the lazy, lazy fare philosophy and, and where we were as a country, either from a foreign relations 
and or military perspective? Well, the Army was a disaster. It was, it was, it was late at 17th in the world after Portugal. Um, and it was extremely weak. Uh, two years before 39, 37, when MacArthur was still chief of staff, he said the whole United States Army, the whole United States Army, officers, enlisted men, the whole deal, cooks, everybody, could fit into Yankee Stadium. And so we had, we had nothing. And the Army was demoralized. They were, they were paid poorly. Um, even at 39, the, uh, they've been, some of their salary had been taken back as part of the New Deal belt tightening. Um, the, 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 the most absurd part of the Army, I, I think, prior to that, that date in 1939, was if you joined the Army and you wanted a, a gun that worked, a calibrated World War I rifle, because they didn't have new rifles, if you wanted one that was actually calibrated and ready to fire in combat, you had to buy it from the Army for over $200, $200 plus, and it came out of your monthly which was about $21. So, so it was, I mean, the, the, the deprivation of these poor guys who were in the army. Um, if you wanted to change uh, bases, if you wanted to go from one base to another transfer, you had to get out of the army, re-enlist, and pay for the transfer. Uh, there was no money for transportation. There was, no, there was nothing. And, um, we, and the United States was at that time uh, very much involved in protecting itself and it was it was the depression and the great thing that happened the very day the very same day that the war began uh franklin d roosevelt realizing the, the problems that were out there franklin d roosevelt picked up um uh, uh george c marshall as his chief of staff and he had to go down about 25 people on the list to get to marshall but he saw in marshall this this sort of this genius and this ability to um actually be a no man say no to him on certain things um so uh and and, and it was a brilliant decision the united states at that time was isolationist it did not um it, it, it wanted to stay out of the war in europe but it knew that the pressures were building to bring at, as that 39 became later on and going into 1940 um, the Nazis were attacking Britain. They were, the France was teetering. Um, everything would got worse and worse looking. So we had to, we had to basically, there were two factions in the country. One was the, 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 the um, people who wanted to stay out of war at any cost. We basically wanted to get rid of the army. It was a huge factor. The isolationists. They wanted to build the Navy, but not have a, not even worry about the army because they couldn't imagine us having to fight overseas. And then there were what they were called, for lack of a better term, the interventionists, the, new, the people that knew at some moment we would be forced into the war. We also had our eye on the other side of the world at Japan, which was becoming more and more bellicose, belligerent, um, uh, making noise about uh, conquering all of Asia, um, driving the British out of Hong Kong, this kind of thing, driving the Americans out of the Philippines. So this was, so, so there was going on at both ends. But what had to be done was not only did they have to start gearing up an industry, you know, aircraft, et cetera, which was, which was quite doable because we had a lot of brilliant companies that were looking for sort of a way out of the depression that needed the money and needed to uh, open the assembly lines. But we also had to get a, to create an army. And that was the biggest problem was, was how do you create this big army? How do you go from, from, from zero to 70 in, in terms of an army? So you're, you're, you know, you've got an army of 60,000. Um, they're not mobile. They're not well-trained. Um, they're, they're, um, they're deprived of many things. Many of the bases they were at would have virtually no recreation, no movie theater, no this, but it would be out in the middle of nowhere. And the, the bases in 39, the bases were just horrible, horrible places, especially the ones that were remote in the far west, the deep south. Um, they were usually a, 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 a base and then surrounded by a street of nothing, honky tonks and houses of prostitution and land, and land you know, uh, loan sharks. And so it was, a, it was a demoralized force. And the, one of the only reasons they could keep their number was the depression. At least it was a steady salary and three meals a day. 
in having served myself in the military and as, as well as an AmeriCorps member, I'm a, a, Mer a former AmeriCorps member, I'm a big proponent of national service. And I've always been interested in the CCC. Um, in fact, I think we should still have the program, you know, today uh, in our country. Uh, do you, you argue in the book that the CCC was a precursor for the GI Army. Can you explain? Well, not, I, I, I not only argue that it was a precursor, but I argue that it may have saved the Army entirely. Because in 1933, um, when, when Roosevelt first came into office, one of his great dreams was this tree army, this army that would go out and reforest the country that would build golf courses, that would build hiking trails, that would create recreation, recreational, you know, build picnic tables for state parks. I mean, everything you can imagine, outhouses for national parks. They would do, they would do this enormous job and they would reforest the part, the part of the Dust Bowl. They would, they, would, they would, every state, every corner of the country was gonna have these guys. But Roosevelt realized almost immediately after he declares he's gonna start this thing, that he doesn't have anyone to run it. And he realizes the logical person to run it, the people to run it are, is the army. So he goes to General MacArthur, who is then army chief of staff, and he says, um, General, we would like your guys to run the army. And MacArthur comes back and he said, we'll do it, I'll do it on one condition. You're planning to cut my junior officer corps. You're planning to cut all my officers by about a third. You're planning to, as part of your austerity as you go into the New Deal. He said, I'll run the new, I'll run it, but you gotta give me my officers back. You can't take my officers. Well, looking back later, it was obvious the people he would have had to give, get rid of included Eisenhower, Patton, Mark Clark, on and on, Grunther, um, some of the greatest men in, in World War II were then at a level of officership where they could have been expanded. They weren't, they weren't on the high or great officer. So then what happens is a lot of these officers were immediately uh, given uh, huge numbers of men to take care of. Uh, one of them was Marshall himself. Marshall himself had tens of thousands of men mm -hmm. to take care of. And what he realized was these were guys who were, the got people, the men who were recruited into the CCC, it was only for men. Um, it was racially, uh, there were men from all races, but it was segregated. There were huge camps of, of blacks and huge camps of whites. Um, and um, Omar Bradley was another one of the ones that was given a huge number, tremendous number of men to take care of. These are guys who were really down on their legs. Some of them were, were, were almost verging on, they, they, were, they were, a lot of them were running wild on the highways, hitchhiking, they were hobos, they were often um, involved in robberies and theft and such. And they had to corral them. He basically brought them all together, put them, you know, asked them, they volunteered to go to these uh, uh, camps. But what Marshall realized immediately was he had to discipline these men, but he had no authority to punish them. So if you tend to a guy, throws it, a guy throws a cigarette butt on the ground, and he said, Marshall said, pick that up. The guy says, no. You don't have to pick it up. I'm going home. He gets up, walks off and go home. So Marshall and Bradley and these other young officers with trading these men realize they have to learn to discipline, not with punishment, but with understanding, compassion, firmness, and giving the men, them a, a sense of self-worth. And one of the first things that Marshall does for his men is he starts recruiting dentists because these men have horrible teeth. They're, they're, they're in terrible disrepair. And he convinces some of the top dentists in America. One, one, one place that he ran the camps was out on the state of Washington. That's one of the leading academic dentists in the Northwest. And the guy says, I don't have time for these men. And, and Marshall says, well, wait a second. I'm going to give you a, a group of men that, that are part of every part of the country. It's the perfect sort of random sample. I'm going to give you these guys, and you can do all these tests and do all this, you know, research. So, so he builds this, this, gives these guys, all of the Army guys, give these guys a tremendous sense of self-worth. They're given diplomas. Marshall himself would write letters of recommendation to these men. So then as world, the World War II breaks out, these guys 
they're, they're in good shape because they've been fixed up physically. They've been educated because the camps had education. They become the backbone of the army. They become the non-commissioned officers, the sergeants, uh, and, and the vast, vast number of them go into the military as a non-commissioned officer. They understand drilling. They understand discipline. They understand uh, nutrition. Mm -hmm. They understand brushing your teeth. Um, and you've got those guys and, the, and another huge cohort of former CCC guys go into industry. And they go into industry because of their, their experience. They don't go in as, as sort of just common uh, people on the assembly line. They go in as foremen. A lot of them end up as foremen in, in the aircraft industry. So it's this great uh, moment in American history where you, you create a social system which brings huge numbers of people out of the, the, the lowest kind of poverty. And a, lot, and a lot of the men in the CCC said, well, or most of them uh, were required to send the money home to their families. So their families didn't starve. And it, it basically gave the army backbone. And Marshall, and Mrs. Marshall too, she wrote a whole thing about it, but he said, this helped make the army what it was. We learned so much from these men. Uh, and so it, it, it was, I, I find the thing fascinating. And of course, now all of a sudden people are talking about national service again. And a lot of people believe that we could use um, a new CCC to uh, combat uh, uh, global warming and to, and to help clean up the rest of the cleanup we have to do on the air and water and, uh, and reforest because one of the, one of the, there's this huge need for reforestation and even re, re, re sort of re-polish uh, some of our recreational facilities. I, I totally agree. That's what I was alluding to earlier. I'm a big proponent of, of some sort of national service program, uh, either military service or AmeriCorps, or just uh, recreating um, the, the CCC or something along those lines that could do so many things. Our national parks have infrastructure problems. Uh, there are a lot of places where I think a, a recreated or reconstituted CCC could benefit. I want to pause for a second and just remind everybody if you have questions, um, you know, we, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, please, uh, you know, type into the Q&A bar uh, and pose some questions for, for me to ask Paul here shortly. Uh, and then in a, in a, while Paul is talking, uh, I'm going to also show some slides that will uh, include some images from the book. Um, if you haven't picked up the book yet, again, I would highly recommend it. You talked, you talked about Marshall, uh, and you know, just a side note about Marshall. Um, if you haven't been to his uh, home down in Leesburg, Virginia, Dodona Manor, I, anybody that's listening, I would encourage you to, to go down to Leesburg, Virginia, just right, right down Route 15 and visit. It's a beautiful uh, place and a wonderful museum to, to him and his wife and his, his work as in the Army and Secretary of State and whatnot. But, You've already talked about Marshall and some of the other characters. You weave so many characters into your, the story you tell, whether it's Omar Bradley, George C. Marshall, uh, Patton and Eisenhower, um, and others. What did you discover about you know, one or more of these individuals that you found interesting or that you learned, learned that you didn't know before? I, well, I, it's hard to pick one out of the of a lot, but, but uh, I think Eisenhower is one of the most fascinating ones because he, he, during this period, he he's really wants to get in. He he's, he really wants to get into a position of authority as an as an officer, as a combat officer, and such. And uh, we watch him in the book come into the Louisiana maneuvers. And part of the reason we got this army ready to go into war in, in, in World War II. I mean, the, and again, the framework of the book is we go from zero to seventy. We end up because of Marshall, because of all these other people, and because of the 1940 draft, peacetime draft, we end up with an army of almost uh, over 1.4 million people by the night of Pearl Harbor. The night of Pearl Harbor, we have got an army that is mobile, well-trained, uh, 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 good, a good morale, ready to fight the Nazis on the ground. We didn't have the ships to get them over there, but they but they were they were they were ready to go, and so it took this. Uh, Marshall himself had to find the leaders that would become the leaders of World War II. He's got by the time of Pearl Harbor, 
he's picked all of his top guys. He's so smart that he picks, and, then he, and he starts to watch Eisenhower like a hawk. And he sees Eisenhower during these maneuvers. And he sees Eisenhower as these abilities, which are, if not unique, they were singular. His ability to get along with the press. The press loved him because while well, these maneuvers are going on, they're very complicated. And that, you know, a lot of military guys would have come out and just, well, and Alpha, and, you know, snowed them with a, sort of this tactical stuff. I just came out and, like a guy sitting on his black back porch and said, look, here's what's going on here. We're going to happen. Um, he had this tent in Louisiana during these massive, massive half a million man maneuvers in the swamps of Louisiana. And he's got this tent and he's got coffee and he's got liquor. And he's got everything. And so he gets along with the press. He also, he really early on, it's very clear that he has this astonishing ability with his men, with, with the enlisted guys under him, that he has this uh, skill, which Marshall shared. Marshall is, they bo both have this singular ability to relate to their men um, uh, in the, um, in, in, in the service. So, um, you know, the famous picture of Eisenhower at, uh, on the D-Day, on the evening of D-Day, um, Eisenhower is, is um, he's in this jacket and it's, and it's the, they call it the Eisenhower jacket. And, and one of the things about it is all the men knew that he was dressed not in fatigues on the evening of D-Day, but he was dressed in the, the jacket he would wear in a funeral. And so what, um, what he was saying to those men was, by just his attire, and that picture is probably one of the classic pictures of all time, that he knew a lot of them were going to die. And he, this, was the, this was the uniform he would wear to their funeral. So it was this ability. So Eisenhower, and you, and you really, in the book, you really follow Eisenhower. You see him getting his, his becoming Eisenhower. Patton, you see becoming Patton. Patton. In the, in the, he's bold, he's brash, he's, 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 he's the toughest, um, most dynamic officer you can imagine. And during the maneuvers, he actually, he cheats. He, brought the maneuver, he was supposed to go this way, and he, he goes all the way through Texas, because this huge, uh, it, during a, a mock battle, and doesn't stay in Louisiana like he's supposed to, he goes all the way through Texas, comes around and comes behind the other army, and, um, and he and he uh, he wins. And the, and the final thing they say, well, you cheated. He said you went you went through Texas and you bought gasoline for the tanks because American tanks at that time were not running on diesel but on the gas gas. He said you spent your own money on gasoline and you did this huge end run and it was totally illegal. And 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 and, and uh, Patton says, well, he said Hitler's going to cheat too. And, and there was that brashness that, that everybody saw. And writing on down the line, Omar Bradley, um, uh, Marshall sees him as the great leader. And Marshall puts his reputation on the line to create the Officer Candidate School. The Officer Candidate School was created during the maneuvers, during before Pearl Harbor. And that was, uh, uh, Marshall and, and Bradley believed in, that every unit had at least one enlisted guy who should have been an officer. So this was the first time in history where it was an official way that a, that a highly a motivated, well-disciplined, enlisted guy could become an officer. And those officers were pulled out of the, out of, out of the, from, the, from the enlisted ranks, and they became the backbone of the officer corps, the junior officer corps, in World War II. They, they won the war. I mean, they helped win the war. So, uh, so these people come out of, they're, they're fascinating characters. I, and there were characters in the book. I mean, one of, my, one of the great characters in the book for me was, was Bob Hope, because he was part of the coal morale that was building, the culture of the GI. And, and, and Hope was entertaining the troops from be, well before the war. And he became, um, at one point, John Steinbeck, who's writing as a journalist for the New York Herald Tribune, uh, Steinbeck discovers hope in a combat zone. And he said, when the history of this war is over, uh, Bob Hope will be one of the heroes. And he said, this man was fearless. He would go into combat zones. He would entertain severely injured people. It was, he said, Steinbeck said it was taking, it must've been taking a huge toll on him 
psychically and seeing these men with double amputees and things. And he would go in with these gags. He would, he would go into this room from seriously injured men and he said, well, they're having this real problem at home. Um, they're not getting enough uh, powdered eggs, you know? And, 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 and it was, but the idea that John Steinbeck would write, write, you know, write about Bob Hope as one of the heroes of the war. And, and there were other people that just pop up. You can't believe it. Like one of the things that Marshall does before Pearl Harbor, he realizes that film is going to be a great motivator for his own troops. So he recruits, guess who? Frank Capper, the greatest filmmaker in Hollywood. And he recruits him to make movies to show to the recruits, to the draftees, for the men going into, into the war. And so this is before Pearl Harbor. And the other thing that Marshall, uh, Marshall does remarkably, and it's a gutsy, gutsy thing that he does, he basically purges the army. He gets rid of 200, about 200 senior officers who are either alcoholic, unable to get along with their men, unable to make firm decisions and good decisions. He purges, he throws them out, or he puts them, many of them he puts in a, in a place where they're harmless, more or less. And um, it's, a, it's a great moment. And, and in their place, he brings up, again, I'm saying the same things over and over, Omar Bradley, Eisenhower, Patton, etc. cetera. So um, uh, th th this is the, sort of the magic I found in the book was even that moment of the purge was, it really took courage to do it because he almost had to quit the army. I mean, there was such pressure on him and he was, it was very unpopular, but he knew he couldn't do it. And when the war was going, H.G. Wells, the famous writer, was writing mm -hmm. about it. He said, he said, one of the things the Americans did that was brilliant was purging the officers that didn't belong in the army. And uh, he said the British didn't do it and the French didn't do it, and they paid for it. He said the genius of Marshall was he got rid of these guys and without apologies uh, and, and basically moved, to, moved the guy the men into place that could win the war. And, you know, I, I mentioned the Dona Manor, Manor in reference to uh, Marshall. Of course, you mentioned Eisenhower. And of course, one of my favorite places and my wife's favorite places to visit is the Eisenhower home up in Gettysburg. So again, for those that are listening and watching, tuning in, um, if you haven't been to both either or of those places, I encourage you to, to, to check them out. So let's talk about the draft. Uh, in the beginning, um, it was a 12-month period that, that folks uh, were drafted for. And um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt went to co Congress to ask to extend that service period. What was that legislative decision like? Well, that decision, I, can I finish back for just one second? Because the draft itself was, was engineered by a man that very few people have heard of named Grenville Clark, who was a well-to-do wealth, a wealthy, well-to-do, very brilliant lawyer in New York, who uh, had his much impact in American history. And he realized at a certain point in 1940, early 1940, that the United States needed to have a draft. And he was opposed at, originally by Roosevelt, by, by Marshall didn't like the idea of a civilian. He put together this amazing crew of presidents of universities, former generals, uh, and they've got the draft passed. He even hired the PR guy, that had been the public relations guy for the New York World's Fair to help sell the public on the idea of the draft. He got it in, and they, but they had to compromise. And by this time, Roosevelt is very reluctant to support the draft because he's afraid what it will do to his reelection um, chances. And the miracle that happens is the Republicans nominate Woodrow, I mean, Wilkie, uh, and Wilkie is pro-draft, and I, that allows Roosevelt. But the, the, the original draft was for one year, um, and, um, and it was, they were trying to extend it and as, as it got closer to the, the war itself. And there was a vote in the House of Representatives, 203 to 202, which allowed them to keep the draft going and keep those men in uniform. And there, there was, it was the closest thing. There were some shenanigans. Lyndon Johnson was involved and several other politicians um, that we still hear about today or knew went on. Um, and there was a quick gavel at one point in the voting, but, but, but what it did was it essentially meant the army was not going, the tens of thousands of men were not going to be sent home, but they were going to be kept in the army. 
And what was important about it, even later, Marshall said, if that had gone the other way, if, if they had gotten rid of the draft at that point or, or the extension of the draft, it would have, um, it would have meant uh, the, uh, the war probably would have gone on until, and this is Marshall speaking, until 1950, with the loss of at least another million people worldwide. Wow. He said, that's how, that's how important that one vote was. So there's a, that, in the book, it's a cliffhanger. You sort of know it's going to happen. It's, I mean, I try to write the book as if you didn't know who was going to win World War II. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's what, that's what narrative writing is all about. I said, I wonder if you'll pull this off. I wonder, you know. Yeah, you, you, told, me, you told me the other day, yeah, spoiler alert, uh, we, won, we won the war, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of the things, and you somewhat alluded to this um, early on, but one of the things I actually learned about from your book um, were the military maneuvers through the South. It wasn't something that I was too familiar with. Uh, from uh, why do you think? Uh, can you talk a little bit about those maneuvers? Um, you know, maybe a little bit of stra strategy or tactics, and and their their value or the importance that they had uh, in in the early training. Well, what, hap what, what, what happened was they start drafting guys in the late fall of 1940, and they're, they're, they're building barracks, they're, bu they're building uh, whole bases, they're putting in sewer systems, they're building in, you know, massive building and, and getting ready for these guys. And they throw these guys into these bases, and all they do all day, you know, they're original draftees, they're trained a little bit, and, they're, and then they're, they're drilled every day. They go, they start at 10 in the morning, and they are at right, 6 in the morning. They drill for a couple hours, they have a couple classes, and then they read comic books for the rest of the day. And um, the, the morale was starting to really slip in these bases, especially those that were remote and in places where there was no uh, movie theaters, there was no recreation to speak of. In fact, Marshall felt so badly about this that at one point he goes, he, he leaves Washington, goes to a base in South Carolina in civilian clothes, checks into a hotel, and wanders through the bars and restaurants and hotels, talking to these guys. And, and he's, here he is, the chief of staff, and he's, in, he's dressed up in you know, a sports jacket and a, and, a, and, a, and a pair of khakis or something. Um, but what, what happens is that it's really realized in order to get this army working, the only thing they can really do is they've got to, they've got to test them in the field. They've got to get them out there. They've got to, and they've got to prove to themselves that they can move huge amounts of supply, water, eggs everything uh, uh, gasoline they've got to they've got to create this huge mobility and one of the features of the book i'll just hold this up really just if you can see it but this is a map that in the end pages of the book show the where the maneuvers are this is how one group went through the maneuvers and what happened was the um they started in tennessee and they're very interesting there are people in tennessee have never seen anything like it a lot of them never seen an aircraft before they've never seen a tank um, but they start there and and uh, and they begin to train these troops groups are reserve groups groups are brought from all over the country and they finish those maneuvers and then even a larger group is brought in um, into Louisiana first of the uh, in the deep south but mostly in, LA, in Louisiana that's up to, by this time there's a half a million men in those maneuvers there are more men in those maneuvers in in Louisiana in 1941, then we're in the whole army in 2019. I mean, it was that big, and um, they ran them there, and then they they segued over to another set of maneuvers in the Carolinas. And these were these they were these were testing the men in swamps and with huge uh, problems with weather through the Tennessee. There's some of the uh, things that were going on in Tennessee were there were nights that would go well below freezing. They were up in the mountains, um, but it was testing them and it was testing the mobility. And Eisenhower, after the war, says what we learned in Louisiana and Tennessee and the Carolinas was we learned how to we learned logistics. We learned how to move stuff. We learned how to supply stuff. We learned how to feed these guys. We learned how to get their hair cut. We had, you know, they were, there were semi-trailers down there fixing boots. They figured out how to fix boots out there. Um, the whole mechanism of the Army, and, and, and Leisner later says, it's what got them across, it's what got the, 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 the Americans across Europe to win the war in Europe. 
uh, was this ability to move things and get things where they were needed, including, you know, things like gasoline and water. I mean, there, uh, one friend of mine was older than I am, was a little kid in Louisiana, in Texas. And he, and he watched, it, it was written in the Louisiana border, and a little kid, he watched these huge tanker trucks filled with water heading to Louisiana for fresh potable water for the troops. And, and, and you know, nobody starved. They were, they were well fed. And there were, you know, Eisenhower finds a cook, that's a, a chef that's so great in Louisiana. There's some complaints that he's over, you know, he's, he's going off on his own. He's spicing the food. And Eisenhower finds this guy. And Eisenhower loves to cook. He loves, that's his great hobby is cooking, beef stew and all that. And he finds this cook and he's, he said, and they bring, later brings the cook to Europe to be his cook in Europe and after the war. And then the guy opens up a, a, new, a restaurant in New York, and, which Eisenhower goes to all the time. And, and so it was this, this moment where that everybody got to sort of learn how to do it. And, and during this, and this culture emerged during this, these maneuvers. So there's a young guy there named Bill Malden who starts doing these wonderful cartoons. And another couple cartoonists are there for this whole period. And they're doing this amazing, amazing cartooning. And, and um, Marshall himself works to help build this, this um, uh, culture of GI, uh, GI culture. He actually has a handbook in which he gives them their own slang. You know, over the hill means you deserted. That, he was actually feeding them their own slang so they would have a sense of, uh, of, of being a cohort, of being a group uh, together. I have one final question, but I'm going to hold that till the end. Uh, we actually have some questions from the audience. Heidi asks uh, Paul if he would repeat the two best military libraries that you mentioned on uh, at the outset. Oh, I would. The, the, it's the Pritzker Library in Chicago uh, that that's the best. And, and the other place I would I did a lot of the research was at the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. But the but the, I think the, uh, the the Pritzker is the one. At least in terms of public libraries, uh, ones that you can join. I mean, you have to be, have a subscription to it, but, but it's, it's open to the public, and they have a phenomenal, phenomenal collection of material. Fantastic, and we also asked. Uh, I, I did share some images uh, while you were talking, uh, and and someone wrote uh, that they'd never seen these pictures before. Do your does your book have the attribution credits? You know, uh, in terms of where they could find the original sources. Um. Yes and no. A lot of them I had to buy. Uh, a lot of them are not in public places. A lot of them are. Um, a lot of newspapers were getting rid of their morgues, and they were. I bought some of them on eBay, and others were. Um, others were old army pictures that I picked up uh, and bought. Uh, so there, there, there are very few pictures that are out there on the public. Even the Library of Congress, I think, has four or five, and. Um, they're, they're sort of hard to find. Um, and a lot of them were taken by the army itself, which had a huge public publicity department going during the war, uh, during the maneuvers. Right? And I just sh shared a handful. Uh, I'd encourage you to pick up the book. There are some wonderful images that Paul used uh, in the book. Uh, another question, uh, and if you have any other questions, this would be the time to, to ask them, because uh, we're coming up close to the end of the program. Uh, but Beth, Beth asked, were blacks drafted to serve in World War II and could they easily enlist? Were black, you, well, the question was, was black, were blacks? Were blacks drafted to serve in World War II and could they easily enlist? Yes, uh, I, that's a great question because the major portion of the book is about the struggle, the, the, more or less the counter narrative, the huge struggle of blacks to become part of an integrated army. And so many blacks were, they were drafted, uh, but they were, uh, they were required to stay in their own barracks. They didn't eat with white uh, soldiers. They've been treated badly through every war. In World War I, um, the, the, the army, uh, uh, the combat troops who were uh, African-American um, were not allowed to fight with the Americans. They had to fight with the French. They had to fight with the French colonials. Uh, and the struggle during the war is, is vast to get this integration. In fact, in 1940, July 1st, 19, I'm sorry, 41, uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, in order to integrate the army, uh, threatens a march on Washington, 100,000 uh, uh, people. And of course, that's deferred, 
Roosevelt convinces him not to do it. That's deferred to the famous uh, one we all know about, March on Washington. Um, and it's a, an amazing battle. And it doesn't end with, in the book, I go all the way through the Truman uh, 1948 uh, order. But Truman doesn't enforce it. And Truman, Truman um, is forced to do it, forced to, this, because black people at that point, um, led by Adam Clayton Powell, are going to boycott the draft. So he, he puts out the edict, but a lot of the enforcement comes with Eisenhower, who, who comes with a fiercely coming in to enforce it, and Kennedy. And it's not till 50 years afterwards that, that Secretary of Defense Cohen, who was then Secretary of Defense, said the Army is now integrated and maybe the most perfectly integrated uh, element of American life. Um, and it's, 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 it's probably still, you could probably still make that claim. I think close to 40% of the military is now, is now uh, uh, people of color. Yeah, and you mentioned, I, I believe you mentioned, uh, even during the maneuvers in the South about the, like the 366th, which were a part of World War I, couldn't even participate in those, right? Oh, there was this amazing uh, all, all, all African-American unit out of Massachusetts, reserve unit phenomenal unit, had done really well in World War I, and they're disinvited to the maneuvers because they're all black, including their commanding officers and, and, and uh, every, everybody in the, and what they were afraid of was that this command, who was a colonel, would go, they would get to Louisiana and every lieutenant and every uh, sergeant, every would have to salute a black man. And that's how bad it was, was they held this group aside they marginalized them officially because they were so afraid of, of, the, of what it would do to the, you know, the, 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 the Jim Crow that was, that was uh, we, what they used to call segregation was called Jim Crow. And it was a venal system. And the, black, and the, and the, the amazing story that comes out in the book is that the blacks really outdid themselves. They believed in the double V, which was the victory the big campaign among black people during the war was double V, victory over, over the Axis, victory over our enemies, and victory over Jim Crow. There were the two victories, so double V. Um, my final question is really about, it uh, goes back to you know, the lessons that we learned in 1939, you know, 40, 41, and how, that, how you think, in your opinion, that would translate or materialize into today and today's army. So what were the lessons learned uh, during that time period in, in scaling up, ramping up, retooling, wh whatever you want to call it, the army and to, you know, obviously the, the fierce, you know, number one military in the, in the world. I, I think, I, I, I think that the answer is at every element, you come back to the same L word, leadership. And I think leadership and, and, and a brilliance of, of being able to work, keep the, the old civil rights move thing was keep your eye on the prize. And uh, my f favorite example may be that Roosevelt knows he's gonna have to fight a war and he's gonna have to win it. And there's some reluctance on the, there's some of the isolationists are Republicans. And he's really got to break that. And what he immediately does, and one day he appoints Stimson is Secretary of War, who's a Republican, and Knox is the Secretary of Navy, who's a Republican. He basically creates this, uh, this model of, of cooperation. And even though they, they, uh, Stimson and, and, and uh, uh, Knox were very critical of the New Deal, very critical of some of his economic policies, they were the ones that won the war for. And they were the ones that brought everybody aboard. So it, 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 they had to get it together. So, so it's, it's, and I, to me, that's leadership. That's brilliance that you, that you, 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 you can do that. Otherwise you're sunk. If you can't put together the country as a whole and whether you're fighting COVID or, or, or uh, the Nazis, you can, you know, the lesson's pretty obvious. And uh, do you have any closing comments or thoughts? Maybe something from the book that we haven't covered tonight? Not really. It's just um, I think I think folks will get a. I have a lot of fun reading it. It's not. It's um, it's. I think there are a lot of really strong personalities. It's a very. If somebody said to me today, he said, "You know, your 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 timing is perfect because 
here's a book. It's a very upbeat book that makes you proud of America, subtracting the whole business of the Jim Crow, but 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 about but the, about the way we did things, the way we marshaled ourselves. The way they, you know, the people now are screaming, "Oh, I don't want to wear a mask. It's impinging on my my freedom." People were drafted in peacetime, and there was very little resistance. They were just pulled out of their jobs. And, and they, you know, they took, they, they drafted Vanderbilts and Rockefellers. They drafted the guy who was the uh, head of the New York Stock Exchange. Hmm. And he goes off without a peep. All right, I'm going to go peel potatoes, you know. So, so there's, I just think that's the other thing. Is there's a thing in the American spirit. It comes alive in this book. And I think uh, some people have said it's a tonic. You know, on our book club, I was reading another book about the 1918 plague and uh, influenza. And I said, well, I, can't, I want to get away from the, the, uh, the, the viruses and <laughs> embrace them. Well, your book's also timely because, you know, the past couple of years we've been, as a country, uh, commemorating the 75th anniversary of various, you know, World War II milestones, of course, uh, uh, you know, VD Day, uh, Norman Vision of Normandy last year, and of course, uh, this August 12th is the 75th anniversary of VJ Day, uh, the victory over J uh, Imperial Japan. So, you know, Paul, I want to thank you very much for being our guests. You know, I would encourage folks to definitely pick up the book, The Rise of the GI Army. Uh, you can get it at Curious Iguana, our independent uh, uh, down, downtown Frederick bookstore. You can also get it, uh, you know, on IndieBound, uh, which is a, another way to support independent bookstores or anywhere that you find books. Um, again, our next program is uh, August 12th, and we hope uh, folks will uh, tune in on that. But, Paul, thank you very much for being our guest. Thank you, Sean. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you.